Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Valerie Mueller, and I'm an associate professor at Arizona State University and a non-resident fellow at IFPRI. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this PIM webinar. The topic we're going to discuss today is migration and global agri-food systems, insights from CGR research and beyond. And the intent of the webinar is to highlight the work embodied in the last 10 years of the CGR research program on policies, institutions, and markets, PIM and discuss future directions for migration research under 1CJR. Um, as panelists, we've put together five questions to frame the discussion around key policy insights and that come from past work and where we might think about pursuing questions in the future. But before delving into the topic, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. So we have Alan DeBrow. He's a senior research fellow in the Markets, Trade and Institutions Division at IFPRI. And his research is focused on understanding evolution of rural labor markets in the developing economy and the effects on migration source households. We also have Katrina Kosick, who's a senior research fellow in the Development Strategy and Governance Division at IFPRI. And she also is a theme leader for public investment, and she leads a research program on gen gender, agriculture, and rural transformation. Um, we also mm -hmm. have Linguer Mambier who's the Principal Fragility and Resilience Officer at the Transition States Coordination Office of the African Development Bank. And her research focuses on the determinants of irregular migration, the impact of migration on the left behind, and the relationship between climate change, natural disasters, and migration. And finally, we have Esha Saveri, who's a Senior Economist with the World Bank's Water Global Practice, and she recently led and authored a flagship report on water migration and development titled Ebb and Flow. Um, Frank Place, our PIM director, is also here with us, and he's going to provide some closing remarks at the end of the webinar. But before we begin, I have a few notes on how we proceed. So as I said before, we're framing the discussion around questions that we prepared in advance. We do want to hear from the online audience, so let us, like, please use the question window on the right side of your screens to send your comments and questions at any time during the webinar. And I'll be monitoring the questions and try to um, introduce them to the panel to answer them. And um, we'll try to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session, but if many come up during a particular question, we'll take them at that point as well. Uh, when you do ask your question, please let us know who you are and where you are from. And finally, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on the PIM website shortly after the live event. It's going to be on the same page you visited to register. All right, let's begin. So rural rural migration has been observed to be common in several countries. Do we know if the migrants are moving to areas with higher average farm sizes or to areas with higher rural wages, or are there other reasons behind these moves? Alan, do you have any insights on this question? Sure, thanks, Valerie. Thanks uh, for all the listeners to for being here, et cetera, and we're, we're really looking forward to your questions. Um, thinking about rural rural migration, is different because we tend to uh, first think about rural, urban, or international migration reflexively when we think about migration. But there is quite a bit of, of rural, rural uh, migration that takes place in the world and for, for various reasons. So as you alluded to, Valerie, one reason is that um, there are jobs in other places, it's often in other in countries. So there are really uh, two types of jobs that I want to highlight, and one would be where you have really big farms, like plantation types of farms, and um, rural people, people from rural areas will go there uh, to make higher wages than they could either at home or, in particular, if you think about it, um, plantations often uh, will have, be able to uh, farm in seasons that, that uh, rain-fed agriculture can't farm in, and as a result, they're able to find those higher-paying jobs at times when essentially the the wages that they would make would be zero. Um, similar, a similar type of rural job that people move for is to go and mine, um, to work in mines. So we see seasonal or or temporary migration to to mines, um, where people again make make wages higher wages. Um, Second, there are so a second group of reasons I think that people migrate um, would be for essentially for marriage. Um, and there's a lot of 
you know, a lot of times that's women my, or, or girls migrating to other areas um, in patrilineal societies and matrilineal societies, it's the other way around. So the men tend to move out of their villages and go live in their, their wives' villages or their, their future wives or partners' villages. Um, these reasons are, we, we don't often, or, or people who are outside of economics don't allude to economic reasons for those types of migration. Um, however, there are ec economic rationales. Um, if you think about it, uh, we, you spread the weather risk, um, essentially, between the two now um, joined households over space. And as we know, weather risks are, are, are correlated within areas, but as you get farther away, they, they, um, they get less and less correlated and, and that can lead to, um, uh, migrate that leads to migration and that's leads to institutions for, for which we have my marriage, um, not within villages. Um, now a last reason that I want to kind of highlight and, and I know there are people on the call who know this stuff or the, the call, the webinar who know this better than me, but, Really, there are reasons within the ecosystem that are that lead to different types of temporary migration. Um, I think I'm going to point out the the Howars. I'm going to be pronouncing this wrong in in Bangladesh um, as a, a really interesting case. And these are um, essentially freshwater wetlands in the northeast of Bangladesh that ebb and flow. Um, the 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 ponds essentially get large enough that uh, waves are as high as four or five feet in um, when there is water. Um, so you can probably likely surf um, on these ponds in the right season. I saw some surfers on Lake Michigan last week, and um, that made me in about five or six foot waves. So I think, you know, we're talking about waves, but these, these actually go away in the dry season. So this leaves great soil for uh, for farming rice. Um, now the waves, of course, are threatening people's um, houses. So there there's real risk of flooding in these areas, but there's real uh, agricultural potential in the dry season. In the other case, and climate change can is changing the way that these powers or freshland way, uh, areas work. And and so that rural rural migration, so people need to move to to work in those areas but or to, to farm in those areas but then they need to move away um so uh when when those areas aren't, aren't working anymore so i think i can leave it there um yeah thanks alan reasons. thanks yeah <laughs> thanks i'm sure we'll, i'm sure this will come up um later some of this question and answers to this aspect of this question will come up uh later why don't we now sort of uh, redirect our attention to critical gender-related issues and concerns in migration. Um, what policy recommendations emerge from them? Katrina, would you like to start with that question? Sure. Thanks so much to Valerie and to our <laughs> listeners today. Um, so I think one of what really comes to the front for me when we're talking about migration and gender is sort of this common narrative of women being left behind when men migrate out of rural areas. But I don't particularly like this narrative because it's ignoring at least a couple really important features of the migration story. And the first of those is that women themselves are also often migrants. They, um, they're, they're not um, staying behind in all cases. And second, women that remain behind are often doing so as a part of a strategic choice made by them or jointly with their households. So they're not merely left behind, they're really playing a critical role in the household's livelihood strategy. But if we break down the idea of who it is that is migrating, we know there are different factors that are cited as the motives for migration for men compared to women. And, and for both genders, right, we often hear education as a motive, but it's more often for men that we see employment motivated migration. And for women, we're seeing this sort of marital uh, marriage related migration as the reason that the individuals themselves or their families are citing for the migration occurring. But I, but I think this, this kind of looks past the idea that when men migrate, women frequently migrate as well. They often migrate with them. And then often these women who are migrating with their husbands are working in the destination where they go. 
So we know that there's this major in economic implication even of this marriage uh, motivated migration by women. And I think this also really points to a missing piece of the story when we simply just identify a woman as a marriage migrant and don't go on to ask what she's actually doing and contributing at the destination. Um, Alan, I know from your work as well that that's been very interesting across at least five countries you've studied looking at the relative importance of individual versus household versus village characteristics in predicting migration. And, and really what came out for me is the fact that these individual characteristics are more important than those other higher level uh, characteristics, um, individual characteristics including gender, also age, education, et cetera, are, are critical for, for understanding um, migration. Moves. So I think it really points to the, the importance of considering gender when we're analyzing migration. Uh, but Valerie, you brought up the idea of policies, and I really want to touch on that a bit. I think it's really important. I just kind of want to set the stage for the fact that the motives are different across genders. Um, so I think it's, it's key to understand that just in the way that there are different drivers and impacts of migration for men versus women, there are going to be different impacts of a given policy for women versus men. Um, so um, just as an example, kind of picking up on research with you, Valerie, um, Valerie and I showed in the case of Ethiopia that men and women are responding differently to the availability of land. Um, and in particular, access to land has this big, um, significant influential impact on employment and migration decisions of young men, but we don't see the same thing for, for young women. Um, so, so what we're really seeing there is that um, we have a setup in which policies that may come in to sort of ensure access to land may have much bigger impacts on male migration than female migration. We've, we've also seen research that show that social protection programs are having gendered impacts on migration. Um, it, these impacts are certainly not uniform across contexts, but there are several contexts in which cash transfers First, have been shown to massively spur male migration with, with comparatively smaller or minimal um, impacts on women's migration. And there's been evidence from Ethiopia, I know that John Hodnot has done, that has shown that public works programs actually retain um, adolescent girls at the origin, um, and we don't see the same impacts for adults and boys. Um, so again, we see these varied across genders, across the, the, the life cycle impacts of uh, a social protection policy that may, uh, that may have uh, migration impacts overall. Um, another policy issue I kind of wanted to raise here is the fact that um, it's really important from a policy perspective to figure out how women remaining behind can be supported to ensure that they have access to necessary productive resources and also to make sure that they aren't sort of mired in time poverty and overburdened with their same domestic workload, but then additionally increased employment um, and responsibilities on their farm and, and, and beyond. Um, now, we know from research that often when men migrate out, you have women that transition from being these sort of contributing family workers to becoming primary farmers. And many have termed this the feminization of agriculture. Uh, but the problem then becomes that you have these prevailing gender norms with which women have to grapple when they're trying to change uh, these roles within agriculture. And women, uh, there's often certain behaviors that are prescribed for women or access rights that are not protected in the same way for them. We see as a result of all of this that male and female labor are not perfect substitutes. Um, and so male out migration has been shown, Alan has work on this as well, um, that it it can fail to improve production outcomes for women as a result. Uh, women have been shown to lack access to irrigation water, forests, land, or even banking, um, and that can be critically inhibiting to them um, in order to be successful at following male out migration. Um, so the question then becomes sort of what can policy do about it? Um, one key point is that legal frameworks, institutions, governance are critical in ensuring women have access to resources and making sure women's voices are prominent within those institutions is critical. If we expect them to benefit women, women need to have influence over the rules uh, that they're making formal and informal. Um, and a second is that there's a lot of potential for, I think at least, innovative programs and interventions that can change mindsets 
um, that can normalize um, boys and men um, engaging in domestic responsibilities, that can promote the take up of labor saving technologies, that can avoid sort of the drudgery when women are trying to do this additional shift of the homework and doing um, agricultural work beyond that. Um, getting male champions to sort of support women in their access to rights. Um, multi-stakeholder platforms in which women have a voice. I think these are all critical. Um, I also wanted to sort of give a, a, a shout out to gender transformative approaches that try to break down the norms themselves. Um, we know these norms are sticky. Even um, I think one kind of example of how sticky the norms are is the fact that often when migrants leave and come back, they bring this enormous um, economic independence that comes with money they've generated abroad. But women suffer uh, in a way that men do not in translating this increased economic independence into having increased management roles on the farm. So really figuring out how to shift norms in order to allow women to, to harness this um, economic independence, I think is critical. Uh, and That's I'll stop great. There, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Katrina. Uh, I was wondering if Linguera had anything to add. Yeah, I think Katrina has said it all, but maybe just insisting on, on a couple of points that seem to me very important. The, the first one is indeed the role of social and cultural norms, actually. And, and I think uh, uh, Katrina has, has mentioned this, but I think it's extremely important to take those two into account in shaping gender related issues. And if we look at migration and gender, and one of the reasons is that patterns of female migration cannot really be fully understood without taking into account the social context in, in which women are evolving. And I think Alan mentioned it in the beginning, if you look at the motive uh, um, of migration for men, it would be mainly work and for women that tend to be marriage, although we know that this is changing more and more. And just to come back to this role of social and cultural norms and say that they determine if women would move or not, the reason why they would move, sometimes women may also migrate to gain more freedom uh, and or, or to join their husband, depends. That would also determine if women would return and that would, in some cases, determine the amount that women would, would uh, send as remittances to their family left behind. So if we do want to tailor, indeed, the most appropriate policy recommendations, I think social and cultural norms should be factored in. And again, of course, uh, uh, these norms, they, they differ from one country to another, from one region to another. And if I take the, the case of Western Central Africa, which is the, the region I, I know the best, women, for example, they, they move more and more, not only for family reason, that's still true for marriage, but we, we observe that they also move to pursue some economic opportunities uh, with regard to trade or with regard to domestic work, for, for instance, or even to study. That's a recent trend that, that we observe in, the, in this region. And I just maybe want to touch on the, the issue of women left behind, which is itself not only an interesting research question, but also an important policy matter. And it is again closely related to the issue of social and gender norms and i think it's katrina who said it right uh, we could have maybe um, after the migration of the household head the male household head some increase of agricultural workload and responsibilities uh, uh, for women and uh, in a paper with uh, with uh, one of my co-author julia and Mats, we look at uh, using uh, the the case of uh, ethiopia if indeed uh, the migration of uh, the male household head would lead to more female autonomy. And that's a very complex uh, question. In the beginning, we thought that that would be straightforward and we would find yes, but actually evidence is rather mixed. And again, this depends a lot on context. In some cases, you would have the migration that could indeed lead to more um, female decision making power, more autonomy. But this relationship may uh, just change when the husband returned, for example. And depending on where the husband migrated, if the husband, for example, migrated into a region with uh, where gender norms, let's say, were um, are kind of um, negative, or uh, uh, you know, you would have a, a context that are not necessarily favorable favorable to uh, to women, uh, the husband can just transfer those type of negative gender norms, if I can say it like that, uh, upon his return. And the decision making power can also be transferred to the in laws, right? So it, it's not like straightforward that when the male move and migrate, the woman, woman would, would uh, gain uh, autonomy. But we find indeed when we use self reported measures, uh, so these are subjective measures, and we find that indeed the migration of, of husbands is an opportunity for women to become more autonomous 
and they can take control over the family income. And this is very important if you take um, and you, if you look at the traditional societies like rural areas uh, uh, of Ethiopia or of Senegal or you know uh, any part of Africa you may take because this has implication actually in terms of spending and in terms of investment in children education for example or in terms of investment in children health because we know that women they spend differently from men when they are uh, in charge of the income of the family. So uh, I, I couldn't agree more uh, when Katrina said that we need to pay attention to female-led households after males' migration in context of traditional societies where you still have this, um, these gender norms that are still kind of holding women from, from being more autonomous or gaining or being just empowered or you know, making decision, uh, life decisions about themselves or for their children, for example. Thanks, Thank Linkware. I, I want to go back to something Alan said earlier, which was related to the role of shocks on migration and labor patterns. How do income or climate related shocks um, influence mobility, either occupational or spatial mobility? Esha, would you like to start with that question? Thanks. Thanks a lot, Valerie, and thank you so much for the invitation to join this discussion, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, so at the World Bank, we recently released a, a flagship report on water migration and development that Valerie mentioned in the introductory remarks called Ebb and Flow. And in volume one, we looked at the impacts of uh, water shocks on internal migration outcomes at the global scale. And in particular, what we did is we focused on uh, the intensifying growing water scarcity uh, together with water variability that we're already seeing to explore these impacts. And what we show in the report is that it's not just the shock itself that matters. It's not the water deficit itself that matters, but it's really the vulnerability and uh, the capacity to cope with that deficit that ultimately leads to the very different migration outcomes that we see for different people. Um, and so this really cautions against making any sweeping conclusions which a lot of the, the body of research also shows. So what we found is that to avoid the ravages of drought, uh, some people do decide to move away and migration can act as a release valve when uh, repeated droughts, so these are recurrent droughts over a number of years, when they induce income shocks. And we find that these types of repeated deficits, they result in five times uh, as much migration as, as water excess. But there are very, very important nuances um, and big buts in this and why and when this migration occurs, uh, because not everyone has the option to move. And what we find is that when there is extreme poverty and um, migration is costly, these repeated droughts can actually stress household finances even further. Uh, and this leaves people with fewer resources to recover or move for jobs. And this is also consistent with other emerging research that is coming out. So when faced with these adverse climatic events, uh, these poor populations, they tend to suffer this double burden because they lack the means to migrate against uh, climatic events, extreme climatic events, uh, which makes them increasingly vulnerable to environmental changes in their places of origin. We also find that for those who are able to move, uh, these types of environmental shocks or water shocks, it affects not only the number of people who move, but also the, the skills that they bring with them. And, and this is why the movement of people is really the movement of human capital. Um, and this movement of human capital is ultimately the key channel through which migration also shapes uh, regional development. And so what we find in the report is that workers who are pushed into uh, cities and those who are escaping droughts, they usually possess lower education levels than other migrant workers, and they're often less advantaged than typical uh, migrants. And so this raises uh, really important implications for the migrants themselves, as well as the receiving regions. So for instance, this means that they face lower wages, and this evidence we find across multiple middle income countries like Mexico, uh, Brazil, Indonesia. And we find that uh, these types of migrants, they face a wage gap of up to 3.4% when they arrive at the destination, 
But not only do these migrants face lower wages, um, they in turn also have poorer access to housing and basic services. Um, so I guess in coming back to you know, the, this policy question, the precise policy mix, of course, will vary across countries. But what we, what we discuss and argue in the report is that the fundamental ingredients would likely remain the same, especially when we're thinking about policies uh, at the destination, which is to proactively integrate uh, such migrants better into job markets, uh, given that more of them may be pushed uh, without jobs to match to. And also that it's really important to invest in no regret policies uh, like building human capital and investing in um, worker education, because these can act as portable assets that can move with people wherever they go. So in, in, in some, you know, we, we find that these types of environmental shocks can really exacerbate pre-existing fractures in our society, notably inequality. So the poorest perhaps are less likely to be able to move. And those who are pushed to move are also less advantaged uh, than other um, migrants. So, um, so those are some of the sort of the general findings that we found at the global scale. And of course, uh, each country and uh, each region uh, will have its uh, own you know, specific uh, policy measures that, that, that would have to be uh, adopted. Um, but in general, it, it really, you know, it, it uh, tells us that we should caution against making any sweeping conclusions. Thanks. That's great. Um, Katrina, I know you've done some work in Central Asia and elsewhere on this topic. Do you have anything else you'd like to add on the subject? Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, Valerie. I, I really like, um, you know, Esha noting migration is this great escape valve following shocks. Um, but I think um, I, I fully agree with her points that um, in some cases, extreme poverty actually prevents having access to this escape valve because you don't have the money to finance a move. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I like the way she sort of distinguished these distressed migrants from uh, people that may migrate at, under very different circumstances um, in terms of their characteristics, in terms of their outcomes at the destination, including uh, wages and housing, and, and as well as their impacts on those um, hosting communities. Um, I definitely think that proactively engaging migrants in job markets is key. I fully agree with with Esha there. Um, I also know there's work showing that you know camps may provide some opportunities. They they may have some um, some benefits as well for migrants, including in terms of lower housing costs. Um, I really think that one point important point I want to I want to uh, raise here is just the idea that not all shocks are created equally. Um, I know that Valerie and I in our in our research in Pakistan have found found that uh, heat stress is a massive uh, uh, motivator of male migration, uh, but we don't find the same impacts of, of flooding. I know there's research showing that hurricanes do not have the same impacts that droughts have. So we, we know that different types of shocks are going to have different impacts on migration. And this is really important for response efforts that may try to provide disaster relief and figure out the appropriate timing for that disaster relief to think about the fact that there's, there's very different implications here and um, the need to rebuild the circumstances and, and whether they, they yield money that can be used to finance a move, these are all critical pieces in determining what are going to be the proper policy responses and, 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 and sort of the behavioral responses of those affected by the disasters. Um, context, I wanted to say, also really matters. Um, and so I think that that is important. We really, we've got to be careful in having conclusions from one region necessarily transplanted into another uh, without understanding uh, the, the nature of, of um, interactions there. Um, I wanted to also point out that price shocks, you mentioned um, uh, Central Asia, Valerie. I've got research in Kyrgyzstan showing the, the role of price shocks um, in, in driving migration. And what we found there is when you sort of have these plausibly exogenous shocks to major prices, um, um, we used a, a Bartik instrument um, a method for identification there. But what we find is that both men and women are, are, are moving as a response to declines in income. But men's responses are statistically significantly greater. Men are more likely to migrate in response to these shocks. Women, on the other hand, 
are more likely compared to men who remain at origin to increase their hours of labor supplied following a decline in income. So we see this increased drop in leisure, increase in work by women who remain behind, and then a phenomenon in which both genders are migrating, but men are more likely to use that as the sort of, um, as the response. And one of the troubling things we found there actually is that in response to these declines in income, it occurs with a lag, but men are more likely to pursue non-compulsory education and we don't find um, impacts for women. So you get this initial dip in pursuing non-compulsory education for both genders. And then for men, it's more than compensated and they become more likely to, to study, um, it, have non-compulsory education. And we don't find the same effect for women. So what you have, boom, there is this increase in the gender gap in pursuit of non-compulsory education. So I feel like that's an important thing. Again, we need to consider context and what role it plays in this. But in one context, we found um, sort of a worrisome uh, uh, education gap being growing out of moderate fluctuations in income that come out of shifts in prices. So we're not talking about these dramatic uh, shocks that result in huge impacts on behavior and time preferences and um, a slew of other um, impacts that behavioral economists have identified. Just modest shifts in income can result in this gender gap in education growing. So. Um, I uh, wanted to also kind of point out that I think there's some really interesting questions here about how tools for crop adaptation and livelihood diversification in the face of climate change and climate shocks, what role those are going to play over time um, in influencing the relationship between shocks and migration. I think that there's a lot oh, of changes. Actually, happening, so. let's, Katrina, let's hold off on that because that sort of relates to the next question I wanted to ask, if you don't mind. And I'm happy to hear Sounds your perspective great. on this. I, I will yeah. shift the floor to someone else. Thanks. <laughs> I wanted to, you know, that's one of the questions that we really wanted to discuss was whether there was evidence to point to um, governments and UN agencies investing more in agricultural projects and whether that affects migration out of rural areas to either urban areas or international destinations. Um, there's great interest among policy circles and among practitioners about the role between foreign aid and agricultural investments and migration, both internally and internationally. So I was wondering if um, Alan and and then Esha could sort of provide some insights on their thoughts about this relationship between aid and migration. Yeah, this is a little bit of an um, elephant in the room, so to speak, or the webinar right now, because we've been talking very positively about the effects of migration. And um, if you look at the, uh, the world climate around migration right now, there's a lot of um, either pressure from governments or from specific civic groups to try to reduce um, international migration. Um, so one of the ideas that we're hearing, I, I'm hearing from partners uh, kind of uh, voraciously from the WFP who have been working on a project with in West Africa this year, um, but also they're getting it from their donors, like what can we do to reduce migration, whether we think that's a good idea or not, is another story. Um, so one idea that's out there is let's do that through agricultural resilience programming. So the idea would be, so I want to break this down by, by first laying out a couple of facts and then thinking about that and, and then turn it over to Asha. So one, one fact is that international migration, the stock of international migrants in the world tends to be about 3% of the world's population. And that's like an 80 year trend, essentially. Um, so you can quote me on this and you can look at the statistics and it may go farther back, but I know it goes back to 1940 um, or, or basically post-World War II. Um, so as long as the world's population is growing, we're going to see international migration continue to grow. It's just going to happen. Um, the reasons to migrate to are complex. Wage differentials between countries are a compelling reason. And there are, you know, a couple of papers that are, that I think of, uh, right away in this, this regard, but, um, one shows, gives the identity, uh, gives the example of a Haitian who lives in the United States, who lives in the United States versus a Haitian, the same exact Haitian living in Haiti. And that person makes for the same, you know, exact same characteristics, 
uh, wages on an order of magnitude higher, even controlling for cost of living adjustment. Um, and similarly in Tonga uh, versus New Zealand, it's about three times as much using a different paper. Okay, so why don't we just, so we have all of these, you know, passports and, and uh, visas. That's how we restrict these wages to be higher or lower in different places around the world. So a barrier to migration is that startup cost, getting that passport, um, how much it costs to physically move, the risk of getting caught if you do it um, outside of the formal channels, and then job search, uh, et cetera, at the destination. All right, so setting that up, let's go back to resilience. So let's say you have a really fantastic agricultural resilience project. What's that going to do? It's going to reduce the variability of income from agriculture for that household that's participating. And what does that do to the decisions that they make? On one hand, it's going to reduce the negative shocks to their income, which might smooth the, the wages that they get in that from way, or the implicit wages they're getting from agriculture. Um, and maybe you become less compelled to leave. But on the other hand, recall that um, the wages are so different between, between countries. So uh, it may actually be helping you finance those startup costs instead. Um, so I've been trying to tell the WFP and other uh, organizations we work with, invest in that resilience programming, not to try to reduce migration, but because it's good programming and invest in evaluation of that program to show that it's, it's good programming. Um, I'm gonna make one last point here, and that's that there was a paper that came out on Monday um, by, by uh, Esther DeFlo and, and Abhijit Banerjee and, and a co-author whose name I'm forgetting, but it's, it's a reevaluation of, um, of an intervention for the ultra poor in India in which they gave them two cows and 30 weeks of cash transfers. So they go back 10 years later, and sure enough, the, the households have 20% higher incomes that they gave the cows and the cash transfers to uh, relative to the other ones. And they find that the reason is actually they these households tended to transition into sending migrants out uh, seven to 10 years uh, in sort of that medium, medium to long term. So, there you, so um, this is kind of direct indirect evidence that 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 channel is, is not there it's a very cool paper thanks for mentioning it Alan Esha do you have any um, other things to say on this thanks thanks Valerie and and a great point by Alan I agree this is the elephant in the room it's the big question uh, but I'm going to perhaps you know reflect on this in the context of the climatic shocks that I spoke of earlier and how these investments in rural areas might interact with those shocks. I think we need more evidence of those things, you know, the interactions between uh, both the environmental stressors and these types of investments. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, the vulnerability and the capacity to cope with these types of environmental shocks, um, it, 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 that's what really determines uh, the different migration outcomes that you might see. And so, in that context, you know, can rural adaptation strategies that moderate uh, the impact of shocks on income influence migration? And I think there is some evidence to suggest that yes, it, it can. So for instance, in the report, we show that building water storage, and so this is related to, you know, agricultural uh, rural livelihoods. So building water storage can really smooth the peaks and troughs um, in rainfall, and it is a form of insurance, as is irrigation. And so this buffering role uh, that water storage plays can alter the agricultural opportunity costs, if you will, and can reduce uh, the incentives to migrate. Uh, but alongside this, you know, built infrastructure, we also speak of green infrastructure and natural capital uh, in the report. So these are things like water sh watersheds, uh, and their associated forests because they can enhance the resilience and quality of water supplies and they can also provide drought proof sources of income uh, to the rural poor so investing in their preservation can also provide long-term benefits and furthermore you know these types of households would benefit from diversified livelihood portfolios um, including non-agricultural sources that can provide an opportunity to mitigate 
uh, against climatic risks. But I want to make a statement here about water storage and these types of investments. Um, because these these have you know sort of long long lives uh, they can create part dependency sometimes these water storage infrastructures can actually lure people to ecologically risky areas and potentially stretch um, local supplies and they they could they could upset an already tenuous um, resource balance so to give you an example we find this in the report and earlier work that we've done at the bank that the availability of irrigation in arid areas arid you know ecologically risky areas for example like the sahel it can create the illusion of abundance uh, which increases the cultivation of water intensive crops that are ultimately unsuited to those regions and so in these areas irrigation can paradoxically accentuate the adverse impacts of droughts and the end result, as we show in the report, is increasing vulnerability that leads to even more uh, distress migration. So I would you know, argue that an optimal strategy would really need to balance both the short run and long run trade offs. So one, I mean, this would entail one that we need to definitely improve rural productivity in the short run, because it often is the case that the rural sector supports livelihoods for many. And uh, we also know from uh, research that negative rural sector shocks driven by uh, the water shocks that I spoke of or other environmental shocks can spill over to the rest of the economy. And two, we really need to focus on promoting the resilience of communities in the long run, especially when fixed factor supplies of a resource such as water can limit growth. So ultimately, you know, the costs and benefits uh, of policies that enable people to move elsewhere, they have to be considered alongside any policies that encourage or constrain people to remain where they are. And I think this is particularly critical in places where people may become trapped and increasingly vulnerable to high climatic risk or where livelihood opportunities may shrink and become less sustainable in the long term because of climate change. Esha, I think that's a really good point because you see a lot of papers focusing on the role of irrigation, but irrigation without institutional development or management of water basins is, as you say, it might create more water shortages as more beneficiaries come into the system and create greater stress on that water system. So I really like that point that you you mentioned. And I do believe everything you say about giving um, farmers tools to be more resilient. I think that's really true. Common theme in both of your conversation, your discussions, I think. Um, I do want to, I want to have an opportunity to discuss our final question that we, we wanted to talk about. Um, and that is, a, there's a concern about immigration um, you know, quite broadly that migration itself can have negative effects on national food systems, particularly when related to displacement. What implications will migration have for food systems transformation? And we can think about all types of migration here, international, rural, urban, or displaced populations. Linguere, what have you been seeing in your own research and in your own um, progra progra programs with the African Development Bank? Thank you very much, Valerie. And I think really the final point of Asia is a very good um, transition, I think, to this question. And the first reason is that food security remain a developmental challenge for, for Africa. That's a big issue. And if I want to answer your, your question, I mean, it's an issue because we, we have pressures over resources and water scarcity is one of those. Measures. And, and in case of conflict or in case of you know displacement, you also have, if we stick with the example of the Sahel region, if you add to this the demographic pressure in the region, uh, you know you have a kind of combination of, of different sources of, 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 of pressure. You have um, another implication is, for example, you know internal displaced pe people, in many cases, they are farmers or producers. And then in a case of a shock, for example, they become displaced. So this shock, it could be a natural disaster. It could be, you know, in case of conflict, for example, they become displaced and then they, uh, they become consumers, adding a pressure on, on food demand, basically. 
Another issue is, is the, the, the climate change issue and, and all the movement related to it. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't have to convince, I think, anyone on how negative this climate change is for farmers, not only for their production, but how also it heavily affects their, their daily lives in, in general. And if you add to that, you know, the, the urbanization, you know, the, the rising urbanization in particular in Africa, which is creating a lot of challenges also on food systems. So here I'm thinking of the, the rural urban migration, for example. So because of this ur urbanization, it's basically taking over uh, the agricultural land. You also have some loss of agricultural labor. Uh, you have increased pressures on, on food production uh, chains as well, uh, which, which is creating uh, additional tensions. And you have all the compounding factors like the security issues that are blocking food, food flows, for example, and, and that is um, causing um, forced displacement. Um, and again, I, I would like to insist on the case of, of fragile countries or fragile region, and I'm still thinking of the Sahel, where you have you know, a kind of combination of all these issues going on at the same time. You have the security issues, the climate change issue, the demographic pressure, uh, of course, gender inequality due to social norms and so on. And I think we, these are multidimensional uh, um, issues. We can't just, uh, and that would be the second part of my answer, I would say, we cannot incriminate migration for all of these issues because these are multidimensional uh, um, issues and there are lots of things going on at the at the same time and I would like to recall here that indeed migration is a coping mechanism and for many people migration is a way to deal with risk of food <laughs> insecurity for example or to escape hunger so maybe it can create some pressures but we should not forget that it's a coping mechanism also um, so that's why also I would agree with Alan when he says that, you know, this is going to increase anyways because population is increasing and it's a coping mechanism. That, that's true. We need to. And it's the same, um, you know, rhetoric around age when we say, OK, we're going to, to give you more money so you could reduce migration. Well, in the beginning, it will not work that way. If you have more money, then you will be able to afford the migration course, unless you are from Sweden or Finland and then you are rich enough to, to prefer staying where you are, people would start by, by, by moving and then once they are rich enough to stay where they are, then that would reduce migration. But it's a complex relationship. So I, I think we, we really need to come back to this idea of migration as a coping me mechanism and a, and a strategy to, to reduce insecurity. <laughs> and what I would like to say is that also addressing the root cause of food security and more broadly for um, food system transformation cannot again uh, be done to one dimension. And, and that's why we cannot incriminate migration again. And we need to look at the impact of migration in the context of, of structural issues. And that's what we do at the bank and in the department where I work with, which is the, the Transition State Coordination Office. And here I would like just to um, uh, take the example of West Africa, where basically you have a system which is failing to feed its own people. And this is increasing during, uh, it has increased during the past year. You have, you know, all the issues related to the production system in itself, all the agricultural performance. Um, most of these countries, most of the West African countries, they, they, have, they, are, um, uh, they have signed this African Union Maputo Declaration. Uh, under which uh, they kind of commit to allow at least to allocate, sorry, 10% um, of their expenditure to agriculture to boost, you know, the production and for the sake of rural development. But, you know, none of them almost have managed to spend those 10% of expenditure. And we know that agriculture contribute to, you know, in more, uh, contributing more than 20% of the GDP. If you take countries like Cote d'Ivoire, where I'm in, or, or Ghana. So you do have very little investment into agriculture. You have, you know, the issue of the development of value chains, for example. How do we link um, the, the, the smallholders, farmers with all these, uh, um, you know, the agribusinesses? How do we uh, make them kind of um, innovate, you know, a benefit from technological innovation, for example, uh, increase food consumption from local production? So, you know, all the issues around agro-industrialization, uh, the issue of lack of diversification of crops, the issue of transaction costs. I mean, this is not migration, and they heavily impact food system. So 
I, I think if we, and, and that's what we try to do at the bank, it's really to have a kind of holistic approach where we not only look at just, in this case, uh, migration and food system, but all these other dimensions that are entering and that are um, that have to be factoring to be able first to understand this complex relationship and kind of have some tailored uh, uh, policy recommendation that would be effective and, and both in terms of operation but also um, programming and strategies right and that's why we now we are kind of finalizing um, our strategy um, for fragility and resilience but we, we are trying to really align the strategy with our gender strategy, our governance strategy, the private sector strategy, and so on, really to be able to take into account all these different dimensions. And again, it's complex. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think it's necessary to take into account that complexity to be to be effective. Thank you. That's great. I I was actually going to ask um, if you know, since you've been you've had been wearing different hats over your time at the African Development Bank whether you know in your work or in your programming i know you've done a lot with remittances so have you seen any positive studies and anyone can talk about this linking remittances to this you know any aspect of the food transformation um, process that you talk about so in that, what, to what extent can we link remittances to sort of in, enhancing or reinforce you know strengthening the food system transformation yeah, I mean, uh, I, in, indirectly, yes. And actually, uh, we had even a trust fund that were dealing with remittances, but in a broader, uh, the broader aspect of remittances, not only uh, the, the money transfer from migrants, but also all the social remittances, the impact of the diaspora, for example, in, the, in their uh, um, uh, origin communities, uh, kind of, you know, tr trying to, uh, again, making, making it more effective. And um, moving from remittances for consumption and unfortunately because of high poverty level from where, where migrants are from remittances are still directed not everywhere in latin america it's not necessarily true but in most of uh, countries in africa they're still directed toward consumption reasons and not necessarily toward productive investment so we we have some some kind of uh, and also related to that the way we support refugees and force displaced people by helping them and you know sometimes working with uh, um, NGOs or even U U United Nations like UNHCR for example to be able to have um, different actors different stakeholders that would uh, um, develop for example private sector development uh, 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 and we know I, I can take the example of Somalia where uh, private sector is extremely extremely dynamic also it's a very um, I would say um, not. Uh, it's not kind of conducive for the private sector because you have lots of uh, issues. Conflict is one of them. But in those type of fragile setting, fragile environment, we would need partnership between different actors. The diaspora is one of them. And again, uh, we're not only considering. Uh, and I, I'm insisting because I think it's important to look beyond the money and really look at you know all this knowledge transfer, for example, and and also how you involve communities and diaspora, they are still part of their origin communities because they have the expectation of returning, for example, and they are also potential investors for, for their communities. Um, I actually have another question that I'm just gonna throw out there since you started talking about the diasporas and et cetera. There's been some recent work linking, you know, environmental consequences from refugee camps and sort of tendencies for refugees to transform forested land into agricultural land because they lack employment options. Has there been any discussion on how to better integrate refugees in the economic system in at their destination so there's not this um, inclination to deforest land? Um, well, one of our approach where we have, for example, intervention targeting refugees or refugees camps um, is really to uh, factor in and associate host communities. And this is based on, uh, to answer directly your question, this is based on the do no harm principle, because sometimes you would have interventions, and again, going back to aid, where you would have maybe, okay, you, you want to... Um, assist you know these refugees because they are part of this marginalized group of people they are in 
sometimes extreme vulnerability. They don't necessarily have access to basic healthcare services. Their children cannot go to school. They cannot work. But then at the same time, uh, they also, if you take the case of internal displacement, they move to places that also have um, extreme poverty, high inequality level, issues with unemployment, and so on and so forth. So really, you have to be very careful to, in your intervention to not kind of create some uh, unbalances yes. yeah. between the refugees that you are helping and their host communities that, that are not that better off, I would say. Maybe they are not refugees because they, they don't move or they cannot move or they don't want to move, but they belong sometimes to also marginalized group and vulnerable communities. So we really have, and, and this is again why we're finalizing this, uh, this strategy, uh, one of the, the guiding principles, this do no harm principle is, is really key. And it's true for FDP, but I think I know it's true for the World Bank as well, because the World Bank, they also do a lot in terms of fragility and resilience and the UN system and all the UN organization as well. And this is something that is, you know, more and more uh, brought up in discussions, you know, in prevention and do no harm principle, really having trying not to create additional imbalances while trying to, to help, basically. That's great. Thank you so much, um, Guerre, for all your insights on what's happening. Um, I want to allow uh, Frank five minutes to sort of give some closing remarks. Uh, we're, we have about four minutes till the hour. Um, but I want to thank the panelists. Thank you very much for answering the questions very thoughtfully. I, I learned so much from this. I'm sure the audience will learn much from it as well. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Valerie. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I don't know if I'll, I'll need the whole five minutes. So, uh, but uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that we will have a this recording up on the PIM website, and we will share the link around to uh, all of you uh, and uh, others who have registered as well. Um, anyway, so uh, I'll start by saying thanks again to the four panelists: Alan Debra, uh, Katrina Kasik, uh, Linger, Mbai. And Esha Zaveri and to Valerie Mueller for excellent moderating uh, and this interesting webinar. You know, I'd have to say that I have re I've read a lot of publications on migration over the years because we've generated quite a few in the program that I'm uh, involved in. And I'm a multiple migrant uh, myself, domestic and international. But I really learned, like as Valerie said, I learned a lot from the discussion today. It was fascinating. I really liked all the connections made between uh, what's going on, what we observe, and, and policy implications. That was really great. Um, given uh, its fundamental importance to individual, family, village, and country development strategies, the potential research topics around migration are enormous, I think, in scope. Um, and indeed, uh, the PIM, the, the Policies, Institutions, and Markets program that uh, I, we're involved in, many of us, has found that many research topics that were even conceived in different domain areas found it important to address migration dimensions of those, those research area, uh, topics. But nonetheless, we re recognize that what PIM has done and what we heard today represents a small proportion of research conducted and needed on this topic, I think. So now if I kind of bring it down to the CGIR, as uh, we move into the one CGIR and our new re re reform reformulation of ourselves, um, you know, we seek to conduct research that transforms food, land, and water systems. It's, it's in our um, mandate. And so thus, we'll need to continue to understand transformation processes of which migration remains an important part. We heard today that migration has significant relationships with climate, poverty, gender, environment, and nutrition, which are happen to be the five impact areas of the CGIR. So it's going to be very critical um, for, for the CGIR, I think, to, to contribute to these different uh, impact areas. We also heard today that while there are some patterns that can be identified um, in terms of characteristics of migration and so forth, uh, but context matters very much in terms of motivations for migration for men and women and the consequences of that migration. And uh, finally, that migration is an issue that is affected by and affects many other sectors outside of those working in agri-food systems, such as the health, education, infrastructure we heard today. So this suggests to me that uh, an important activity for CGIR will be to prioritize future research and identify key collaborations to embed this research as it moves forward. So um, in the new CGIR, we're formulating uh, initiatives, uh, for those of you who don't know, and we're very hopeful that there's going to be a new initiative that, that 
that positions migration as, as very as a very central pillar to that initiative. And we also have hope, uh, hopefully new impact area platforms uh, that will be functioning early next year. And there's going to be one on poverty reduction, livelihoods and jobs, and another one on gender equality, youth and social inclusion, which again, I think will uh, help to hope uh, provide uh, the mechanisms to, make, to enable um, migration research to flourish in the future of the CGIR. So with those, again, uh, thanks to everybody and, uh, and, and pass along uh, the, the links when you receive them to your colleagues. Um, have a good day or night wherever you are.